mathematics uh, is a very peculiar discipline. I just enjoy doing it, the challenge. It's about trying to find a unifying theory for many phenomena. The sense of unifying things is what allows mathematicians sometimes to find connections that no one else has seen before. Optimal transport is a very important mathematical problem and this is about finding the most efficient way of transporting resources from one place to another. Optimal transport arises in many, many situations, even in some unexpected ones. To give an example, we can think about clouds. To understand this, the best way is to think that clouds are made of particles, billions of particles. If you want to understand the evolution of clouds, what we could do is to take two pictures of the cloud and then you can just ask yourself okay how each particle moved in the two pictures i took total transport provides you the answer it gives you the right answer because you understand that in order to find who, which particle moved where you just need to solve an optimal transport problem so there is a minimizing energy principle nature wants to be efficient it wants to not waste energy and that's what is behind it. So once you understand this principle, you can use it in order to understand much better how clouds evolve. Mathematics is everywhere and it was born as a discipline to model the world. One could think about the tramway system in a city, one could think about the best, most efficient way of transporting goods from a city to another. Sometimes then, of course, you start to build theories that may seem very abstract, but the problems that we try to solve are often motivated by concrete applications. So I'm driven by the goal of knowledge, the goal of keeping doing research and try to solve new problems and giving a contribution to the mathematical community and then to the society as a whole through my research. My name is Alessio Figalli and I'm professor for mathematics at ETH Zurich. Caro Segretario di Stato dell'Ambrogio, sehr geehrter Herr Präsident Schiesser des ETH-Rates, dear ETH-Students, dear ETH-Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this honorary lecture for Professor Figalli. With this special event, ETH honors and celebrates Alessio Figalli, who won the 2018 Fields Medal for his new results, as you saw, in optimal transport problems and his seminal contributions to partial differential equations, geometry, and probability theory. As you all know, the Fields Medal is one of the highest awards that a mathematician can win. Winning one requires exceptional scientific talent and an enormous dedication to science. Carissimo Alessio, il Poli ha sempre avuto una grande tradizione di italianità. Ricordo il consigliere nazionale ticinese Stefano Francini, senza quale la creazione di questo Ateneo non sarebbe stata possibile. Che grande piacere che questa tradizione abbia trovato un nuovo sbocco quest'anno grazie a te. Tu hai fatto un bellissimo regalo al Poli ricevendo la medaglia Fields proprio il primo di agosto che tu, come sai, è il giorno del compleanno della Svizzera. Questo grande onore dimostra che l'eccellenza del Poli è sempre stata e sempre sarà basata su una cultura di accoglienza di studenti e scienziati provenienti da tutto il mondo. Grazie mille. Ancora? No, non ho ancora finito. <ride> I'm sorry, Alessio, you have to listen more to me. I need to earn my salary, you know. <laughs> Dear Alessio, first of all, the Fields Medal is a great recognition for you personally, and I would like to congratulate you once more for your outstanding achievement. However, it is also a source of pride for ATIA and all the institutions you joined before, before arriving here. 
Having such an outstanding colleague as a faculty member at ATH is a great honor and a source of inspiration for all of us. As you know, at ATH we believe that mathematics is our common defining factor and the basic foundation of natural science and engineering. It was Galileo Galilei, as most of you know, who said that mathematics is the language in which the book of nature is written. Indeed, mathematics is a powerful tool that we humans need if we want to understand and solve the complex challenges of our time. Dear Alessio, you put it very nicely in the film that we show right now. Mathematics is about trying to find a unifying theory for many phenomena. This sense of unifying things is what allows mathematicians sometimes to see connections that no one else can see. But it's not just about the seeing. The astounding thing about mathematics is that its result, regardless of how abstract they may be, continue to prove exceptionally useful for science and technology. Differential equations, such as the mange ampere equation, about which Alessio Figali will have much more to tell us in a minute, describe movement and changes. They are one of the key tools of the natural and engineering sciences and an irreplaceable prerequisite for many technical achievements. And mathematics will play an even more important role in future. Biology, medicine, and even social sciences become more and more quantitative and therefore require mathematical ideas to progress. This insight is nothing new at ATO. Ever since its creation, mathematics was at the center of our curriculum. And with the enormous progress in computational possibilities, data and computer science will become part of these foundations as well. For this reason, some colleagues have proposed to create an ATO center for the foundations of data science as a part of the ATO Plus initiative. This center will be led by Peter Bühlmann, here he is, uh, who will later, uh, together with Alessio Figali's dissertation advisors, Luigi Ambrosio and Cedric Villani, benvenuti, bienvenue al Politecnico, uh, talk about uh, Alessandro's achievements. Before I close, let me express my personal gratitude to all faculty members in the mass department. I see many here sitting. These colleagues devote more than half the time for teaching and educating students for, from other departments at ATR. In doing so, they provide the necessary tools for understanding and advancing science and engineering. Moreover, many of them help also educating primary and high school teachers and prepare teaching material for those schools. These colleagues are the great ambassadors of the beautiful country named mathematics. And with you, Alessio, this corps diplomatique has now obtained an outstanding new member. In this sense, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what Professor Virgali has to tell us about his great results on the theory of optimal transportation, optimal transport. Ladies and gentlemen, now, that's a moment, eh? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Figali to his honorary lecture. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, Ladies and Gentlemen, es freut mich sehr, Sie zu begrüßen und danke, dass Sie sich die Zeit genommen haben. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Ich danke Lino Guzella ganz herzlich für die Organisation dieses Anlasses und ich fühle sehr darüber geehrt. Thank you Lino for organizing this. I'm very proud and honored. Um, die Auszeichnung Fils Medal ist für mich eine große Ehre und Freude. Natürlich freut es mich für mich persönlich, aber auch für die ganze ETA. I'm honored for myself and for the whole ETH. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Okay, so now back to English. I think I used the, all the German I could use. <laughs> so uh, today my lecture is about illustrating some of the the um, beauty of nature and uh, the idea of problem solving in mathematics. So, you know, um, 
There is this expression in Italy, avere la testa tra le nuvole, uh, la testa per aria, this idea of having your head in the clouds, in the air. I think there was a sign that maybe I had something like that, that was like, as a child, because you could see the stars in the back. This was me at age five. And uh, then uh, 29 years passed, and uh, I'm more on the ground, but still looking around at nature. And in this case, so bubbles. So um, in my lecture today, I would like to present four different problems and describe how can you study them and what are their connections, some of them a bit unexpected. So the first problem that, you may, that I want to address is soap bubbles. Why are soap bubbles round? Then there is a second problem, which we already saw in the video that uh, was shown 10 minutes ago, about clouds. So if you have clouds moving, you may ask, OK, how particles in cloud move? How can we predict their movement in time? Then a third problem, which is completely unrelated to this, which is about understanding what happens when you have an elastic membrane hitting an obstacle. So an example is, you see, tennis ball hitting the racket. Can we understand the shape of this racket? Uh, sometimes the obstacle can be a bit more, mm, let's say, less regular than a round ball, that uh, the tennis ball. So the obstacle, actually, so the membrane could be the ball, and the obstacle could be a not very <laughs> regular head. <laughs> that you can see how it deforms clearly the ball. And then a fourth problem, again, very much related about how does ice melts to water. So the, the plan of my lecture is first to introduce uh, optimal transport. Through optimal transport, I explain you how to address the question of understanding soap bubbles and clouds, so the first two problems. And then, very briefly at the end, I will go a bit beyond optimal transport and show you that the last two problems that I described, this elastic membrane, and uh, these ice melting to water phenomena are actually more related than one may, may expect. But let's start with optimal transport. And starting with optimal transport, we start with Monge. So we are in 1781, where Gaspar Monge published his famous work, Mémoire sur la théorie de Déblé et de Ramblé. So Déblé, the amount of material that is extracted from the earth, and the Ramblé, the material that you want to put in construction. So Monge uh, worked mostly during uh, actually the Napoleonic period, and um, his goal was to build fortifications. So he had the idea coming from military applications. So essentially, what's the following, right? You have the ground there, and the particles are moved out from the ground, and you want to move them to build this castle. And uh, you want to ask yourself, how should I do this? How should I transport? the particles, which, pa which particle goes where. And uh, the, in case, one important thing that uh, arises in optimal transport is always the choice of the cost. You have to choose what is the cost that you pay when you want to move a particle from position X to position Y. So when you transport, you want to choose what is the cost. So for Monge, the cost was the travel distance. So if you're moving particles Let's say from Zurich uh, to Basel, you just measure how many kilometers is Zurich away from Basel. You pay, I don't know, the number of kilometers. And then if you go to Geneva, the distance is, I don't know, uh, almost three times more, and then you pay three times more, and so on. So this was a very natural model, still maybe oversimplified, but this was really the beginning. It was more than 200 years ago. Then, essentially, for 150 years, nothing happened, until in the 40s, Leonid Kantorovich arrived, and essentially he uh, introduced a new way of thinking about optimal transport, a kind of non-deterministic way. So the idea of Kantorovich was the following. So in Monge, he was moving uh, soil or ground, whatever, and so each piece of uh, material was moved from a point to a different point. So each point X could only be moved, could only be moved to a different point Y. And then Katrovich said, OK, but suppose that I want to transport. I have bakeries, I have coffee shops, and I want to transport maybe bread. 
Well, then maybe that this one bakery may supply more than one coffee shop. And uh, you see that maybe the configuration is even a bit more complicated because this bakery can supply three coffee shops here, but maybe the amount of bread that this bakery is producing is not enough to, for all the demand. And so this coffee shop may get a bit of bread from this one, but maybe it needs a bit more also from this other bakery because th there is not enough production here. And so you start to get, of course, with you know, 10 elements, it's easy, but if you have millions and millions maybe of elements, the problem becomes less trivial to solve. Still, Kantorovich developed a very robust theory in order to find a solution to these kind of problems. What the, find essentially the best, the cheapest possible um, solution in order to minimize the transportation costs. So he was drawing all the right arrows and telling exactly how much mass you should move from each point, to, how much bread you should transport from each bakery to each coffee shop. And actually, he got the, no, the Nobel Prize for Economics for this contribution. Okay, so this is still kind of about the history of uh, optimal transport. Then, essentially, 40 more years passed by with not so many contributions, until in the 80s, uh, Brenier, Rush, and Rushendorf, Rack and, and Rushendorf arrived, and essentially, they really put the basis for what is the, now the modern theory of optimal transport, really the mathematical theory, what mathematicians do now. So essentially, they put this in a more general framework where you have a cost function, CXY, which can be very general, and essentially you want to minimize the transportation cost given this cost function. And then you have several natural questions, like does an optimal transport exist, and can we understand how it looks like, and then can we apply it in concrete situations? So uh, this cost function actually plays an important role. And uh, I told you already that for Monge, the cost was the distance, x minus y. Cxy is the distance between two points. Actually, for many applications to nature, the distance is not natural. You should rather take one half x minus y square. This reminds a bit for those uh, I have a background in physics, the kinetic energy, one half velocity square. Uh, so that's kind of, the, there is a more of physical meaning behind this rather than this. This was just a modeling assumption. But actually, you see, if you look in the background, this picture, where there are all these streets and mountains, you know, when you want to do transport between cities, you cannot forget that there is a geography. So if between two cities there is a mountain or there is a valley, you should take care of that because, of course, it cannot be, you cannot go straight, as there was nothing in between. And so the, the, maybe the choice of the cost is, should be more complicated than just and something like x minus y or x minus y square, at least for uh, this application to transport of goods, because you want to, of course, uh, take care of the, let's say, take into account the, geogra the geography of the space. Okay, now these questions are actually rather well understood in the theory, and I will not enter into that. I just wanted to mention. And actually, more than this, optimal transport by now is a, is a topic that has found application in many, many areas. And I just list a few of them. So urban planning, of course, it's rather intuitive. Optimal transport is, can tell you how to build a city, how to build uh, infrastructures, same way distribution of resources. It appears in engineering design, it appears in statistics, hydrodynamics, image processing. Actually, there are models of the, about the growth, the, the beginning of the universe using optimal transport. Meteorology, we'll talk about clouds. And um, for instance, biology. In the biology, it's very natural because, uh, for instance, trees, they have to transport the, let's say, all the nutrients from the ground up to the leaves. And the, 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 shape, of the, the, sh the shape that we see in the leaves and in the trees are exactly done in such a way to optimize the way of transporting these um, nutrients. So in fact, in biology, you see a lot of optimal transport. And, uh, and there is much more than this, but of course, I will not have time to discuss. So I would like, in fact, in this lecture, to focus more on what I've done. So what I've done has been applying optimal transport to other topics. And essentially, there are two main topics that have been listed at the very beginning as questions. This question about soap bubbles and this question about clouds. So let's start by soap bubbles. Why soap bubbles are round and all this? So there is, I will start with a legend. 
this is the legend of Dido. So you, we are back in the 8th century be, uh, before Christ, and what happened is that um, the um, brother of Dido had killed her husband, and uh, this is very classical in this mythology, right? Everyone kills everyone in the family, and then uh, it's always a mess. <laughs> and uh, that's what happened also in this one. And as a result, Dido fled uh, the city of Tyre, and, and she escaped until she landed in the realm of King Yarbas. So she arrived in, the, in, the, uh, to, in front of King Yarbas, and she asked to buy from the king a piece of land where she could found uh, where she could build the city and live with her servants. And then the king accepted the deal, he accepted the money, and said, okay, I'll give you as much land as, uh, for her money, she could get as much land as she could enclose with a single oxide. So the oxide is just the skin of the, of the bull, let's say. So it's just the skin of one animal, which is not much, probably two square meters at most. But then Dido was a very smart woman, never tried to trick a woman, I mean, they're dangerous. And so Dido cut the oxide into incredibly thin strips, and then, so you see, this cut. And then she took the strip and she sewed them together, and in this way she obtained a very, very long cord. And by sewing the strip, she was having then in this way to get this long cord that then she used to draw this line on the coast, very big line, and inside this region, she built the city of Carthage. So, this event is um, commemorated actually in mathematics because it actually brings up a very interesting mathematical problem. And the problem is, okay, given the cord that you obtain from by cut, uh, gluing together these pieces of oxide, how should, which shape should you give to the cord in order to enclose as much land as possible? So you see here, I already gave you a bit the suggestion. So it's, it looks like a nice piece of a circle. So in fact, uh, the, so this problem um, of Dido is commemorated in mathematics like uh, the isoperimetric problem. And the problem is the following. Give a curve of a certain length and close the maximum amount of area. The, another way to formulate the same problem is given fix the area minimize the length among curves that enclose such, such an amount. So it's the same problem. And now, actually, the solution is, depends whether you are in the interland, so if you are inside, away from the coast, and the solution will be a, a circle, so your city should be round. If you're on the coast, and we think that the coast is completely flat, then the best solution is this half circle. You can take advantage of the coast to actually get a bit more area. And this is the solution of the superimetric problem in the plane. Now, the same formulation here, minimize length among curves and closing a fixed area, can be asked in three dimensions. And this, right, and this is why now we can talk about soap bubbles. So, given a certain volume, what is the least surface area needed to enclose it? This is the superimetric problem in three dimensions. So it's the analog of my problem just uh, in the space. And the answer is actually given by soap bubbles, and the answer is a sphere. And why that's the case? Because when you play with soap bubbles, you are blowing air inside the soap bubble. The soap bubble close up. The moment it close up, the amount of air, in, the amount of air inside the, the soap bubble is fixed, in some fixed amount, which will not go out, uh, in or out. And then the soap bubbles we want to minimize immediately by physical principle, its total energy tension. And the energy tension, again, one can show, be, is the same as the area. So these are physical considerations that one needs to make, but essentially the soap bubbles, what they do instantaneously after you, they close up is they want to minimize the area at fixed volume because the amount of air inside is fixed. And so they become round. So the superimetric, so this is why they're round is because they're minimizing, the, they're solving the superimetric problem. Okay. Now, uh, more than that. So, in fact, this is a model that works for soap bubbles, but actually you can do things more interesting than this. Because in the, uh, a bit more than 100 years ago, Gibbs and Wolf understood that, in fact, the model, the fact that uh, soap bubbles are round because they minimize the area can actually be generalized to say that crystals take some particular shape 
So you see crystals have usually very uh, rigid shapes at a, at a small scale. Uh, they take a particular shape because, again, they minimize some kind of uh, surface energy. So they, it's the same principle. This is a bit the concept uh, that also Lino was discussing, that the mathematicians want to unify. For mathematicians, so bubbles and crystals are essentially the same object because they obey morally to similar laws. And you, on the, a mathematical level, once you think about formulas rather than about the modeling, the formulas are rather similar. And you can just play with one or the other. And so that's why um, this is what Wolf discovered. And uh, this is why we can study also crystal. And then you can ask the following question. So this is the question I got interested is what happens if you take a crystal and you add some energy to the system? So for instance, you take, um, you take a crystal and you start to raise the temperature. And then the crystal will change shape. So you can see on the, in particular on the left, this cell and at the beginning at low temperature is almost the same as the beginning. Then it gets a bit still similar, but after some temp if the temperature is too high, then okay, it becomes completely unpredictable. But at least for low temperature, close to zero, you would like to say, okay, can I understand the shape? Can I theoretically explain that the sh um, this fact that the shape doesn't change much? And can I estimate this change of shape? So this is the question we want to study. So based on the amount of energy given to the system, to the system um, understand how much is the change in shape. Um, this question was what we studied, and we used optimal transport. So essentially, uh, how did we use it? So let's say we have the crystal on the left, which is the crystal at cold temperature, zero temperature, very uh, kind of rigid. Then the temperature starts to raise, go up, go up, and you get something like this. And then you would like to understand, uh, we would like to study the change in shape from left to right. And so what we did was to say, okay, let's look how each particle moved in this process, each particle, compo the infinitesimal particles composing the crystal moved in this process, and we kind of found the, we used transport to kind of relate this configuration to this one. So we looked at the process of transporting particles from left to right. And by using tools from optimal transport, then we could obtain the following theorem, that if epsilon is the energy, is amount of energy added to the system, then the shape of the crystal can change at most by square root of epsilon. So this is the theorem that we proved. And this square root of epsilon is optimal, in the sense that uh, if you, so this is epsilon to the power one half, and if you put a different power, uh, let's say larger than one half, the result will be false. So it's really, you cannot prove anything better than this. Square root of epsilon is the sharp behavior of relation between energy and shape. So this is an example where transport can use, be used to study crystals. Next one, uh, clouds. So this one, we already have seen it a bit in the video, so I will go maybe a bit faster. Essentially, when you want to study these kind of equations, these equations are extremely complicated. So all looks maybe simple sometimes if you draw pictures, but the system is something like that, which is not so, uh, let's say, appealing to be seen, right? And you would like to understand the solution to this equation, which are terrible to study. And there are all these parameters, the velocity, the pressure, the buoyancy, and the semi-geostrophic wind. But then, if you start to put a bit of, um, this is where the human factor comes. You, just, you cannot just take the equation and plug it in a computer. It will be a disaster. But if you think enough, you can actually understand that there is a connection, that these equations are connected to optimal transport. And so why optimal transport is useful? Because now, suppose that you look at the particles at time t, a certain time, t0, and now you look at the particles at time t0 plus delta t, so just after, let's say one second after. So I have the particles on the left and the particle on the right. And then I ask you, can you say which particle went where? So just by looking at the two configurations, can you tell me which particle on the left corresponds to which particle on the right? Optimal transport allows you to do that, and it allows you to put colors so that now you know exactly who went where. Now you know it, right? Each color corresponds to the one. 
So to solve this, you need optimal transfer. It tells you now the coupling. And um, actually, this connection was found in the 90s by Mike Cullen. But in fact, although this connection to optimal transport has been known for more than 20 years, uh, there was some lack of theory at the optimal transport level, which didn't allow people to use it. And this is what I've been doing with uh, several collaborators, among them uh, Guido De Filippis, and then also later uh, on this problem of geostrophic clouds, Maria Colombo and Luigi Ambrosio. And uh, why this picture? So I like this picture because this picture is kind of telling you uh, it's a model of solving a mathematical problem. You want to go on the top of the mountain, and you may try several different paths, but you don't know which one is going to bring you to the top. And sometimes you go and you get stuck, and you have to go back and try another one because maybe your, your try completely failed. And then at the end, after a lot of time, you may find the successful one and get to the top of the mountain. But this means sometimes getting stuck and having also the frustration of going back to the bottom and starting again. And now, really, in a couple of minutes, uh, let's go beyond optimal transport and just look at these two problems that I showed you at the very beginning. So on the left, this tennis ball, and on the right, this ice melts into water. And the question is, what do these problems have in common? So again, mathematics can be the right tool to unify things, because the, these problems can be mathematically described by the same equations. So I wrote down the equations just for you to show you that what I mean. Of course, I don't expect uh, no mathematician to understand this. But I think uh, if you look at it, so for elastic membrane, if you denote by v, so you always have to, write the, to find the right variables, but if v denotes the distance between the elastic membrane and the obstacle, then the v satisfies an equation like this. Laplace and v equal characteristic of v positive. And then if you take in, instead ice melt into water, theta is the temperature of the water, and you define v to be the integral of the temperature, then the integral of the temperature solves this. And you see, this is a, these are exactly the same equation there is an extra term here just because this is a static problem. You are trying to understand the shape of a membrane lying an above an obstacle. And this is a dynamic problem where there is time in, some, some time involved because there is, so there is this phenomenon of melting. But if you forget just that there is an extra term, which is from a analytic uh, point of view is very similar, there are the same equation just for different variables. Again, this is the power of mathematics, right? I mean, once you forget about the, the, the problems, you just write down the equation, you find the right variables. Once you solve one equation, you solve, in fact, two problems together, which look, they don't look rather the same, right? Mem elastic membrane and ice melt into water. So uh, I wanted to, uh, I hope by all this list, to kind of convince you that um, mathematics can be uh, important can be useful for several problems, for applications, but also sometimes uh, there are not always applications, but sometimes there can be future applications. That's why uh, mathematics is a very good investment. And uh, having made advertisement for this, I think uh, since we have uh, still a lot to do today, that's uh, enough for now, and thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Alessio, for a wonderful talk. And dear guests, dear colleagues, let me again thank you for being with us tonight to celebrate Alessio's Fields Medal. I'm, I'm the chairman of the Department of Mathematics. I'm here. My job is essential to tell you that we're very proud of him. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, we are very proud of him, and we are excited over, over his contributions to ETA to come. In fact, just this morning, I was, we were out to lunch this afternoon, and 
He just told me that he spent two hours this morning teaching differential equations to hundreds of students of electrical engineering. So we really look forward to this for many years to come. So <laughs> now he's a little bit <laughs> terrified that he will be doing, but we are very grateful for his contributions to ETH. Of course, successes like this do not happen in isolation and require help and support. And indeed, we received tremendous support from ETH. And on, my, on behalf of my department, I would like to thank the ETH leadership, in particular, uh, President Lino Gutsela, for their continual support. Thank you very much, Lino. Also, we have been blessed with the very generous support, both financially and morally, of the Swiss Confederation. We truly appreciate it deeply. And also, with this, we recognize that we have the duty to provide the best education to the youth of this great nation and the cutting-edge scientific know-how to its industry. So I hope that the Field Medal of Alessio and his dedication to his students are taken by you as indications that all members of ETH Zuri take this responsibility very seriously. The second part of this evening is a panel discussion moderated by Peter, uh, Professor Peter Bühlmann, a native of uh, Zurich. Peter has been at ETH for many years, and he was the chairperson prior to me. Under, under his leadership, the, uh, the department grew and recruited many talented mathematicians, including Alessio. To the panel, we welcome two supervisors of Alessio, Professors Luigi Ambrosio and Cedric Villani. Professor Cedric Villani's brilliant career as a scientist started at Ecole Normale in Paris, and he himself received the Fields Medal in 2010 for his work on questions similar to what Alessio just described a minute ago. More recently, however, Cedric has taken leadership positions not only in science, but also in the society at large. Last year, he was elected to the French National, uh, National Assembly and also to the academy, but even before, by receiving 70% of the votes in his district. So he's currently the vice chair of the French Parliament's Office for Science and Technology, and he's, as I mentioned, a member of the French Academy of Sciences. Cédric, maybe, just yes, thank you. <laughs> maybe you have to take... Alessio's second advisor, Luigi Ambrosia, is a professor of Scuola Normale di Pisa, a scientific powerhouse which influenced the whole world and educated numerous scientists like Alessio, Luigi, and many others. Luigi's work on calculus of variations, geometric measure theory, and optimal transport has been inspiration to many. He has received the Fermat Prize in 2003. He was invited to the International Congress of Mathematicians twice, and many other things, and beginning next year, he will be a member of Executive Committee of the International Mathematical Union. And uh, Ale Luigi, please, thank you. Thank you. And before ending, I also would like to introduce one more great scientist who can only be with us in spirit. Late. Professor Enino De Giorgi of Scuola Normale. He was a teacher of many great mathematicians like Luigi. De Giorgi's work has had tremendous impact and he has become the soul of the powerful Italian school of mathematics. I'm sure that his omnipresence will be felt throughout this discussion that will follow. So here he is the picture of uh, De Giorgi and Alessio. Maybe there is some family connections, I don't know. <laughs> Now I would ask my colleague, Peter Bielman, to take over. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so we're entering now the stage of a moderated discussion and uh, Thank you, Alessia, for this wonderful talk about your exciting research. We have now a bit time to feel the fascination of mathematics, which is emitted from Alessia. 
And in the first part of this discussion, we touch a bit on the biographical aspects of uh, Alessio's life, and I'd like to start asking Luigi, can you tell us a bit about Alessio as a mathematician and how did you get to know him? Uh, yeah, maybe I can start telling about my first encounter with Alessio. It's a story I told in other occasions, but uh, it's good to recollect here. Alessio came to my office, I think you were in the second or third year. Uh, second. Or second. <laughs> yeah, I always make this mistake. And uh, he already had defended the thesis uh, uh, at the first level, uh, the graduate thesis on uh, geometric measure theory under the supervision of another professor, Giovanni Alberti. And then he came to me telling me, well, you know, I want to learn more. I learned more, to more deeper geometric measure theory, which, by the way, is the, one of the favorite subjects of Ennio de Giorgi, was uh, remembered a while ago. And then on that occasion, I made a kind of, I think, risky move, but sometimes, as professors, we do this kind of things. He, he was insisting in having really something deep. And I gave him basically the most advanced paper on this topic. I, had a, I wrote a few years before. It was an 80 pages paper yeah. on, uh, on Acta Mathematica. And I was expecting not to see him for a while. But, <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, it happened that he came, I don't know, one week later or even before. <laughs> Very soon he came later. Of course, he was coming with questions, but uh, it was clear to me from the question he made to me that he had uh, completely understood the paper. And that was the beginning of our collaboration. OK. Well, that was an interesting uh, perspective. Maybe, Cedric, you want to mention something about mm -hmm. what makes Alessio so special as a mathematician and mm -hmm. what are his outstanding talents? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> OK. Uh, first thing about uh, Alessio, I would say, is the appetite. <laughs> <laughs> Alessio arrives, he will see you, for instance, discussing with a colleague, and then he will come, what is it I want to know about what, what problem you are discussing? Or, professor, give me something to work on, etc., etc., etc. And uh, sometimes, completely, it's very surprising. You ask him, he wants to know about a subject, and you mention this is about this and this, and there is some good reference, which is this book and this book, and then he will come, grab the book, read from page one to the last page, <laughs> and then come back one week later and say, what, what, what can we say uh, next? Second thing is the speed. One of the first things when I was uh, astonished, so in those days I was a uh, professor at Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon, and uh, Alessio was coming for a few, uh, first for a few months as part of some uh, exchange, and then he uh, decided to stay for longer since he made his PhD jointly between Pisa and Lyon. And uh, anyway, uh, at some point I had, he was asking for some new problem, and I thought, okay, here is a problem you can think about, it was something about characterization, uh, geometric characterization of optimal transport in some non-smooth space with non-negative curvature anyway. I, I gave him the problem saying, think about it, maybe you have a good idea. It doesn't sound so easy, but you never know. And in the, this was in the morning, and then in the afternoon, I received an email with a solution, complete, typeset in tech, and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and this was typical. Appetite and speed. And third, third thing I would say is the uh, ease to collaborate with people. Going here, do a project with somebody, then with some other, with some other. And the publication list, it's very striking how Alessio was able to collaborate with so many people in fields that are uh, sometimes a bit different, sometimes quite different. So that's an interesting uh, fact. I mean, Alessia has collaborated with many people. Of course, when he did his PhD thesis, I think there's probably still a bit more focused and I mean, smaller aspects of the whole uh, empire of mathematics. And how important is actually his PhD thesis? Is there an outstanding result there? Or did he have his rocket career after his PhD? Can you? comment a bit on that? Is there a particular result which made him already quite famous in his thesis? 
Well, I, I wouldn't single out a single result. I, I would say that we had to make a choice, and even choosing the title for the thesis was difficult because <laughs> we had so many results inside that eventually we decided only to focus on, on a few of them, and mostly about, uh, this was alluded to by Alessio, to these extensions of these results dealing with the existence of optimal transport maps. How can you, how can you characterize them? Mm -hmm. This was one of the main ingredients. Uh, there were many results at issue. He's one of these guys who work on many different papers at the same time. And uh, I would not be able to single one in particular. There were some very strong results in, uh, in regularity, some very strong results in the related to geometric measure theory. But also, I was very much struck by some results which were not new, but rewritings of previous results. It happened to me a couple of times that Alessio took some of my work and started to rewrite it in a way that looked so much more elementary. Like you see the proof by uh, Alessio and you think, but that is absolutely the correct way to handle this. How was I, how was I blind to not see it? <laughs> okay, so in my perception also what we could see today, I mean, Alessio is not only a very gifted mathematician, but he's also a great communicator, also a nice guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. Family is guy. That, is that important also for the success of his career or something which comes to your mind regarding that? I mean... So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking how much the personality is influencing. Well, of course, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, it's uh, an extremely friendly collaborator, and this uh, helps, helps a lot. I mean, I think uh, people are really chasing him <laughs> to find uh, him as a collaborator. Yeah. I think there are many kinds of mathematicians, and some mathematicians need to work in the, how to say, in the pressure, unbalance, whatever, focusing so much, and some others need to have quite a balance with the personal life and the friends and so on. And Alessio belongs in the second category. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So besides math, I just wonder, do you know about Alessio's hobbies? <laughs> <laughs> if not, Maybe you, Alessio, can just make some sort of <laughs> statement. You can say I can reply myself? Okay. No, I mean, I always liked um, general uh, sports. Uh, you likes the calcio, no? Calcio, soccer, of course. <laughs> Actually, I'm registered now for the soccer tournament inside here at ETH, and uh, I just didn't have much time to play the last week, but uh, I'm supposed, I was supposed to play last week and I missed it because preparing this lecture. <laughs> but uh, no, I like soccer and in general I like sports, then I just like, um, um, I don't know, uh, I've started to learn a bit of basic baking with my wife, very basic. <laughs> Good. She's the professional, I'm just the, the sous chef. <laughs> And, um, yeah, that's yeah. some of the things. I like sports in general. But. That sounds exciting. Very good. So let's move on a bit. So mathematics is, of course, very universal and very international. Still, when Alessio got the Fields Medal, it has been immediately mentioned or pointed out his origin as an Italian and his partial education exposure to mathematics in France. And so... Cedric, is there something special about mathematics and the mathematical culture in France, which distinguishes maybe the rest of the world or from Italy? Or... You know, when you are inside the system, you are not the best base to talk about oh, okay, it. Maybe the... yeah. But... Oh, yeah, of course, I can answer about very easily about the assets of the French system. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I mean, if you ask me about uh, the number of Fields Medal, yeah, of course, um, I mean, uh, France has very, very strong assets which come from the, uh, first of all, the CNRS, uh, then, uh, then uh, very good and stable hiring procedures, which unfortunately we don't have in Italy <laughs> now. And uh, also, I will say the system of the Grande Col, which is much more spread 
Păi să fii compar uh, de col normal, even the one of the col normal in Rudulm, with our scuola normale, by the way, they were both funded by Napoleon, mm -hmm. there is a ratio of one over five. And uh, given this, uh, we are still able to produce quite a good number of talents uh, uh, from, from our school. But I would say the success of the French system is mostly based, in my opinion, on these ingredients. I would, uh, I totally agree with uh, with Luigi, and I would also uh, uh, argue that French mathematical school is very proud of being active in all sectors of mathematics, or almost, and also in combinations with uh, of mathematics, physics, and so on. And uh, at some moments, there has been uh, in France the view that, in many cases, the Italian strengths were more focus on a few subjects, some things like uh, fine analysis, some parts of uh, analytic number theory, of algebraic geometry, and so on. And uh, it was, uh, I think, what was striking in the case of Alessio, maybe, and that is my interpretation, through, in some respect, the influences of Luigi and myself, but also through others, was the merging between uh, in the case of optimal transport, between the very fine, very precise technical schools of geometric measure theory and fine analysis, of which Luigi uh, has been recognized for a long time as a master, this and uh, variational uh, problems, and the much more fuzzy uh, trends that uh, we could find in my work in connections with the physics, connection with the geometry, the probability, whatever. And kind of the synthesis uh, is in part in the work of uh, Alessio. Already, I would say, I think Luigi and myself influenced each other very much in our respective research careers. My book on optimal transport owes a lot really to the influence of Luigi, and I think our encounter... Of course, uh, yeah. and I owe a lot, uh, even my recent research to your work. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's a really a kind of... Uh, paradigmatic example of collaboration between schools, and uh, Alessio took uh, the best on both. Yeah. <laughs> and even better than that. <laughs> so, Alessio, you probably have seen both worlds already as a PhD student. Do you think you have benefited a lot by oh, having yeah, enormous, two yeah. advisors, different style, different countries? Can you expand a bit on it? Or? Oh, yeah. Well, no, I was extremely lucky. I was, okay, uh, I was extremely lucky because I could Essentially, I was going back and forth between Pisa and Lyon. Um, I mean, as, of course, I was also an undergraduate in Pisa, so in Pisa I was very much exposed to the old Italian school, but then in Ecole Normale there, was, there were a lot of people. Uh, uh, there was Cedric, there was also Albert Fati in that period, who also influenced me a lot. Um, so the fact that there was, you know, uh, something that is very important when you're young is to be exposed to different kinds of mathematics, and it's also true, for instance, attending seminars, attending workshops. Essentially, in this way, I was attending both of them. I mean, I was going everywhere. Um, then the good thing is that Luigi and Cedric were super supportive in some sense. So I was completely free to do what I wanted, to go wherever I wanted. Say, oh, I would like to go to the conference. They were always encouraging me. Um, Very good. Yeah. I think, <laughs> well, I think that they trust me. They trusted me, but uh, I mean, they. Uh, I mean, they were super uh, nice. I mean, I was, they never checked what I was doing in the reality. <laughs> <laughs> I was a good kid, but they were... <laughs> it's not like uh, trying to understand uh, oh, what have you doing been doing the last two or three weeks. I mean, they, they, they believed I was doing... Uh, I, I was being well. It was very important for me in my own PhD that I would be allowed to work on whichever subject I wanted. And I thought the same, I applied the same with, uh, with Alessio. Here are some suggestions, son. See what you like. If you don't like this, we'll try to find another subject, etc. But advisor should advise, not impose. Yeah, no. so I was uh, extremely lucky. And then, of course, I benefited from both systems enormously. And the fact that I was already in France, for instance, was uh, also the reason why I could apply to CNRS uh, at a very young age and then start my career in France. So, I mean, I really passed through both worlds and I spent two more years in France actually as uh, a faculty member. So, 
yeah, I, it was enormous, import, enormously important for me. So you were then in France, then you moved to the US, and then you came to Switzerland. So yeah, you what about mathematics in <laughs> Switzerland? Can you make some comments here? Or your impression? <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> well, I mean, um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Just no, feel I mean, free to express your views. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, yeah. No, I mean, uh, I, uh, where are you leaving? Go on. So. Oh. <laughs> there will be something. <laughs> there is a gun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> so, uh, no, mathematics in Switzerland, I must say. Um, so, my experience in. Uh, uh, I came to Switzerland, I think, the first time. Approximately 10 years ago, uh, I was invited to film several times by Tristan Rivier, uh, and so I had the occasion to visit a lot. First year ETA, and then there was um, uh, Camillo De Nellis at the University of Zurich also invited me. So in some sense, I passed through Zurich several times, and I always had a fantastic impression. And uh, I should say that when I was hired in 2016, this came after actually a long-term visit in 2014. I spent a whole semester at ETH, again, visitor of FIM. Um, so I was very much impressed by the, um, the atmosphere here in Zurich. The fact that we have both ETH and University of Zurich is an enormous plus, because uh, really I feel that there is a, I mean, ETH and University really work together as two universities that try to, I mean, try to collaborate as if they were one. Uh, you can see this when we organize um, colloquia, when we organize events. Uh, also, sometimes when there are hirings, I see that there is a lot of support. Everyone is happy if the other institution makes a good hiring because it's a good benefit for everyone. Um, so Zurich is a fantastic pole. It's on the central of Europe. And it has been so. I think it's great. Um, I was also I had I got exposed in other places. I mean, I visited several times uh, uh, Geneva, EPFL. So uh, I mean, Switzerland. Uh, uh, as you say, when you go to the airport, it's, it's a small country, but it's the heart of Europe. I mean, it's true, right? I mean, eight million people, and you see how much things happen and how developed it is uh, for mathematics is exceptional. So. Um, I'm extremely grateful to be here because uh, it's, uh, it's an extremely dynamic environment. And uh, so, I, I hope my answer say is correct. This is the perfect answer you can give. <laughs> and in some no, sense, I mean, very this true. is actually no. the correct answer. Because of that, now you become Swiss citizen tonight. What? And uh, <laughs> of course, you're such. <laughs> A great <laughs> ambassador. <laughs> now, we're really, of course, extremely grateful that you are here in Zurich and in Switzerland. Uh, you really deserve this cap here exactly. and this new passport. <laughs> Also in your role as a wonderful ambassador for Zurich, for ETH, for Switzerland, but we should not forget also worldwide, of course. <laughs> now, of course, both of you are also very important. I appreciate a lot okay, that you're here wait. tonight. But, and maybe you but, should also get a small, a bit of ah. different passport. Ah. It's just a sweet taster for you. Okay, okay so. Chocolates. Yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> Okay, countries aside now. So you can, if you like the cap, you can carry it. But yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> Go Switzerland. <laughs> Let's talk about a bit public and cultural values of mathematics. And uh, maybe Luigi, what role does a high cultural value and social acceptance of mathematics has for mathematical innovation, but maybe also more generally for innovation in science and technology? Can you comment well, on that a bit? Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, this is now a very trend, trendy moment for mathematics because uh, even on the news so you always hear about uh, applications of um, machine learning, uh, uh, big data, and so on. 
Of course, one has to be a little careful with the use of these uh, new tools, but uh, I would say in Italy, but I think also abroad, uh, enrollment in mathematics are going up uh, at a very speed rate, and uh, I think it's very good for a country to have uh, uh, experienced mathematicians who know in depth uh, the tools which are used, not blindly. So I really encourage uh, uh, the growth of mathematics, but not only for <laughs> professional reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I actually think, in a way, maybe it's fair to say that mathematicians often do not want to overstate the importance of our activities, right? We might say that Mathematics is beautiful, we do it because we're fascinated about it and excited to do it. Yet, it might still have some sort of strategic importance and we never overstate that. So, Cedric, what is your view on that? Should we overstate a bit more or should we? We, we, we are learning to overstate a bit more. After <laughs> all, everybody else does, so we should do it a little bit. And uh, there is a truth in there in that in particular, uh, with the drive of uh, machine learning, as uh, Luigi was uh, mentioning, we see that nowadays young mathematicians receive uh, ridiculous offers from the uh, big uh, tech companies for coming and uh, participating in the making of their algorithms and so on. So that mathematics is uh, more than ever now uh, a big stake for the uh, economy. But it's also our duty to insist that math is both application and art. Art in the sense of finding ways to contribute to the knowledge per se, and art in the sense that we are very much driven by the notion of uh, elegance. So if we agree that mathematics is really important, do you have any ideas what are the ideal conditions or environments so that it can flourish at universities, at research institutions, but maybe also at schools, elementary schools, secondary schools? Any sort of ideas mm -hmm. what, what would be needed? Or are we, is it fine like now, or do we need something more? Uh, Everywhere in the world, people want to improve their math education for a number of reasons, more or less acute, depending on the countries. One reason is this economic drive that I was mentioning, but also just the motivation to reduce the amount of pain that there may be in the school system when uh, students just don't understand why the hell they are being tortured with mathematics and teachers don't understand what in hell they are doing with their classrooms trying to teach that, uh, that stuff. And also important because mathematics is like school of uh, logic and reasoning. It has been shown through various uh, statistics and experiments that good course of mathematics are helping to conceptualize and so are helping for almost any other subject. And uh, it's important to, to, to improve this. Uh, it's generally admitted that one of the things that are, are lacking worldwide is the teaching of meaning at the same time as technique. Many people think that teaching math is just teaching the technique and then the meaning will follow for the happy few who will continue in math. But truth is, if you just learn the technique and not the meaning, the beauty, you have no motivation at all. And it's even, maybe even more important than to know that there are some applications. Uh, and then also the importance of engaging the students. It may be through experiments, through manipulation, through whatever, but whenever there is no uh, active engagement from the uh, students just learning, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I, I, was involved also, uh, I was involved in two for my first year. I was well treated. I was given two reports to do for the government. 
One report was about French national strategy for artificial intelligence. Another report was about improvement of the mass education in France. And um, France is famous for its uh, mathematics, but still we are scoring very low currently in international studies and international comparisons in mathematics. Actually, the quality of our education system globally failed rather dramatically in the past two decades or so. And uh, <coughs> one of the key things that, was, uh, that is behind this decline very clearly is about the, our failure to put good training for our teachers. You cannot train the students well in math if your teachers are not well trained and uh, this was not well organized in France in the past decades. So this was our number one set of recommendations. We also insisted on the fact that the meaning of the course of mathematics has become rather obscure nowadays, even for the teachers themselves, and this relies, yes, on a lot of fine balance, what is the part of theory and application, what is the part of uh, experimental and, uh, and concept, how to balance the history and the current world, the technique and the culture, etc. And third, we insisted on all the uh, peri-scholar activities, as we would say, clubs, computer science, uh, uh, chess, uh, bridge, whatever, whatever kind of activities that are social and that help uh, raise the level of uh, conceptual understanding and, uh, and uh, prediction. Okay, and we did a, a good job of convincing the Ministry of Education and currently the strategy is being implemented. It will take years, but it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, Cedric said already many things. Let me just, uh, a few more things which come from my experience as a professor, but also as a, a father. <laughs> so, well, first of all, one should not teach mathematics as a collection or recipes. Or uh, I typically see that many things are added in the program uh, in high school. I mean, one should really focus on a very few concepts and teach only these concepts very well. So there is a lot of redundancy in the teaching of mathematics uh, at uh, the high school level. Also, the other idea which I believe very much and I apply also in my university teaching is always to put an historical perspective in teaching. Uh, typically, uh, mathematics is taught as a completely flattened uh, uh, subject uh, with, with no future developments, no past developments, something which is completely crystallized. While I have seen that uh, teaching them things in a historical perspective helps a lot. And finally, well, this is uh, my personal belief, we should not insist too much on the practical applications because the beauty of mathematics sometimes is uh, in the abstraction. And so sometimes some beautiful abstract theory are trivialized so much that uh, because maybe they insist uh, so much on the applications that uh, this way the theory loses its beauty. Yeah. So there is the thing maybe which we call mathematical thinking, right? It's some sort of precise formulations, uh, having a good quantitative idea. So teaching is, of course, the most important vehicle for the transfer. But how about other ideas of being a politician and kind of bringing mathematical thinking to politics? Or also, of course, managers in companies, they can bring mathematical thinking out there to the world. Would that be an interesting model for transferring mathematics to the larger society. I, I agree that teaching is maybe our core and most important pillar to do it. But do you see uh, any other channels to do that, to transfer math to... Teaching is the core ground. And also it's good to have some people who do kind of translation work, to tell about the research, to give a feeling of what is going on in mathematics today. And uh, among these people, there should be some special scientists, uh, science journalists, 
and also some scientists who talk directly because they are very legitimate to explain what is mm. the research, what is mathematics as an art. Mm. Okay, this is very good. So actually I want to give a bit time to the floor. Maybe you have some sort of a burning question or a comment which you want to make. If you want to make so, there is a microphone, you have to push on the button and then maybe stand up, say who you are and raise your question or say your comment. Okay, maybe you stand up, you say who you are. I know who you are, but... <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about uh, the, you talked about artificial intelligence, right? So, uh, let's say physics lost uh, its virginity with the Los Alamos project in a way. Could it be that mathematics is losing its virginity now with uh, machine learning, uh, big data, artificial intelligence? I think mathematics is uh, eternal virgin. <laughs> 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 and more seriously, I would say that the single most damaging event for the reputation of uh, mathematics in the past decades was the 2008 financial crisis when the role of mathematical finance applied in a careless way and in the same way by many people who thought, okay, it seems to work, let's do it also, otherwise we will not uh, get as money as the other guys, etc., etc. This was, this was terrible. And um, uh, it reminds us that, first, mathematics has many meanings, and some mathematicians will tell you, but what was being applied there was not mathematics, just recipes, just uh, formulas. And other people will tell you, but there were a good amount of mathematicians' brains who were being used and involved in this collective catastrophe, so there is some responsibility. Uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence, Again, it's not the algorithms in themselves. I mean, you see the, the uh, Manhattan Project. It was, let's find the physics to make a bomb. And in, uh, in the case of, uh, in the case of uh, artificial intelligence and so on, the people who were devising the neural networks that are used very much nowadays as uh, core artificial intelligence did not think let us make these neural networks for this or that particular purpose. They wanted to make general, to find general recipes that would be able to recognize a name on an envelope, to recognize a face, etc., etc. And then there are the various uh, declinations. Uh, we have to be to take seriously. The, uh, okay, let's say that artificial intelligence also is not a precise field of either mathematics or science. It's a mixture of algorithmic, uh, science of calculation, statistics, a number of uh, other fields, depending on where you apply it to. And the possibility of bad applications have to be taken uh, quite seriously. Uh, there was a bestseller a couple of years ago by uh, a fellow mathematician who worked in mathematics and in quant, uh, in journalism, named Cathy O'Neill book is called Weapons of Math Destruction. It's, let's say, the reference book of people who want to uh, say what are the real dangers of artificial intelligence, not the science fiction uh, stories in which it takes over mankind, but the real dangers of misuse. And the um, title of the book, we Weapons of Math Destruction, says it clearly with a pun about uh, math and uh, massive and mathematics. And subtitle is something like how big data increases inequalities and threatens democracy. So there you see the dangers in the applications of the, of the artificial intelligence, which, by the way, is not a 
good designation because it's not intelligent at all. <laughs> so we're here in Switzerland. We want to be punctual. And so we have to close this moderated discussion. Thank you very much for uh, taking part of this. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Well, thank you too. Lino. Yeah, you can. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Peter, for this fantastic moderation. Thanks a lot, Professor Villani, Professor Ambrosio, and of course, Alessio. It was very stimulating. I was asked to make a very brief summary. Don't expect me to repeat everything, but a few things that came to my mind. First, everything goes back to Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> I learned. Of course, the who was an excellent mathematician. He did also some bad things, but let's gloss over. <laughs> I mean, Ecole Normale Supérieure, Lyon and in Paris, created, founded by Napoleon. Scuola Normale Superiore a Pisa, fondata da Napoleone. And I have to tell you that when uh, Stefano Francini and all these clever guys, 1848, knew Switzerland is created, they looked for role models and they decided we need a brilliant university that helps build up the country, the bridges, the tunnels, the infrastructure, and they looked to the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, and, uh, which was also created by Napoleon. So at the end of the day, it's all about him. So let's thank Napoleon and the Grand Nation for ça. Huh? <laughs> Secondly, we all know that mass is important. And as you said, Professor Ambrosio, we should not trivialize mathematics because of its importance for application. I completely agree with you. Math is beautiful. Mathematics is beautiful. I, when I'm really depressed, I take some book about linear algebra or, or complex analysis, and then I can relax and I feel... Uh, I, I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> and why is this so? I, I ask myself sometimes, why is this so? Because mathematics is probably the best the closest attempt, the closest approach we can reach as human beings to truth. There is no truth in physics. There is no truth in politics. <laughs> there is no truth in engineering. It's always about guessing. And, but in mass, there is truth. Things that are 100% true. And I think it's very consoling for human beings that are thrown in this world full of perils and insecurity that at least there is some safe haven. And this safe haven is the de Mott department. And in, the, <laughs> and in this sense, I will probably come and show up with you guys from time to time when I really need some help. Huh? <laughs> outstanding people, ladies and gentlemen, come from outstanding, outstanding achievements, ladies and gentlemen, come from outstanding people working together. This again was proven to me many times today in, uh, in uh, Lyon, in, uh, in Pisa, uh, you guys meeting, discussing meeting and discussing at ETH. You said it yourself, ETH is, together with the University of Zurich, is one of the centers where mass is very much cherished. I want to repeat a couple of names, Weil, Hopf, Polya, Dedekind, many, many more. And of course, from now on, Alessio Figali will be listed in this list. We're very proud of you, Alessio. Thank you very much. I have a list of personal quotations tonight. I have added one item on this list, and I hope I will be allowed to use it, Professor Vidani. He said, advisors should advise, not impose. I think this was a very, very wise remark. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Alessio, compliments again. Congratulazioni, siamo molto fieri di te. Uh, you know there will be an opera outside of the main hall here, about, uh, outside of the auditorium maximum. Those of you who are invited, the happy few, please don't forget, 7 o'clock you should be up in the Docenten Foyer. I wish you all a beautiful evening, and let's enjoy mathematics. Bye, Diviani. Arrivederci.